These are the new voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Captain's log, star date 6134.6. The mysterious time slowdown we're experiencing has affected not only every crew member on board, but all the Enterprise's instruments and computer banks. It's as if time itself were winding down, and us with it. Sensor readings confirm my hypothesis, Captain. The slowdown phenomena did not initiate until we came within three light years of that peculiar high density energy field directly ahead. Shut down all warp engines, Mr. Sulu. I want zero acceleration. Stand by on impulse power. Shutting down engines now, Captain. Spock. Fascinating. The time slowdown seems to have leveled itself the moment we stopped approaching the energy field. For the moment, at least, things are getting no slower. That's all I wanted to know. Mr. Chekhov, bring us around to 134.8 degrees on full impulse power. I want to put at least 10 light years between us and that energy field. Aye, sir. As soon as we began moving in another direction, the slowdown effect started reversing itself. And in moments, the crew and the instruments aboard the Enterprise were back to normal, just in time to face a problem of a different nature. Alien vessel moving along our starboard at warp three, Captain. Very well, Mr. Sulu. Shift over to warp one and remain on this course. Lieutenant Uhura, open all hailing frequencies. I'm trying, sir. Let's see what our shadow looks like. Activate the screen. Screen on, Captain. What do you make of it, Spock? Curious. Although I'm not familiar with the design of the vessel, I would most certainly say those markings on its hull suggest we're being flanked by a warship. Message from the alien craft coming through now, sir. Attention, enemy unit. This is Conrack speaking. Surrender your vessel at once or face annihilation. You do not have long to decide. End of transmission, sir. What was that you were saying about a warship, Spock? Perhaps this other ship believes we are responsible for the time slowdown. Uh, that would certainly explain their hostility. They certainly don't feel like explaining it. Damage report. One of our shields is buckling. Moderate casualties in decks 35 to 38. Warp engines holding steady. Arm photon torpedoes, Mr. Chekhov. Photon torpedoes armed and ready, sir. Very well. Bring us about to 25.5 degrees, Mr. Sulu, and we'll be in position to... A moment, Captain. Something strange on my sensor. Report, Spock. Although the dimensions of their warship are even larger than the Enterprise, sensors indicate only two beings aboard. Two? Is that possible? Possible or not, it is a fact, Captain. I would suggest it might be wiser to... I'm way ahead of you, Spock. Transporter room. Scotty, are you still there? Aye, Captain. I just finished repairing her. Fine. Scotty, I want you to lock on to two life forms aboard that alien ship. Spock is feeding the coordinates to you now. Aye, Captain. The figures are coming over loud and clear. I'm activating the transporter now. Be careful, Scotty. Spock and I are on our way. A moment later, two shimmering figures appeared in the transporter dock. The one who called himself Conrack turned out to be a fearsome-looking barbaric warrior wielding a double-edged battle axe. Alongside him was his consort. A much smaller being whose manner of attire made him look like just what he was, a sorcerer. But by the time Spock and I reached the transporter room, Conrack had already destroyed half of it. Scotty was slumped in a corner, his body bruised and battered, and it quickly became apparent Conrack had me marked for the same treatment. Captain, look out! Using all the advanced fighting techniques at my command, the best I could do was just stay alive. Conrack's strength was frightening. If any one of his blows connected at its full force, I was done for. 
but Spock had observed what I was far too busy to notice. All during the fight, Conrack's consort stood absolutely still, his hands rubbing his temples methodically, almost as if he were casting a spell. Acting on pure logic, Spock made an assumption, and he was right. Suddenly, the course of the battle changed. Conrack's unbelievable strength was quickly reduced to the level of a normal man. Now I had the advantage and the superior fighting skills. Enough! Enough! You have done the impossible. You have beaten me, Captain Kirk. Not so impossible, actually. I simply applied a Vulcan nerve pinch to your consort and caused him to pass out. Spock, I suppose I should say thank you, but I don't understand. Everything didn't become clear until we gathered in sickbay a few minutes later, and Dr. McCoy finished examining our pair of invaders. You want to repeat what you just said, Bones? It was very simple, Jim. The little fella... The name is Klee. Sorry, friend. Klee here is an honest-to-goodness sorcerer, to put it bluntly. The peculiar power running through his body defies all analysis. For lack of a better word, I'd have to call the end product of these collective energies inside him magic. Magic? I conjectured something of that nature during your fight with Conrack, Captain. It seems Klee was casting a magic spell to give Conrack an incredible degree of strength. Up until now, Conrack had remained somber and silent, but that was before a report from the bridge came over the intercom. Sulu here, Captain. You told me to report any change in the status of the time slowdown area. Yes, Sulu. Well, sir, it's moved. A full 3,000 kilometers since our first sighting of it. Fascinating. Yes, it moves. It has its own orbit. Conrack, tell us what you know about this thing. Our people call it the Gola. And its far-flung orbit through this part of the galaxy brings it in range of our planet at regular intervals. A more terrible fate for any world I could not imagine. I don't get it. Just what does this Gola do? Think about it, Doctor. You saw what the time slowdown did to us in just a brief interval. Now imagine an entire planet caught in its stagnating influence for centuries at a time. Now I see. Scientific progress, cultural advances, even your people's thinking processes. It would all slow down to a crawl. Correct, Captain. Klee tells me our civilization is the same age as yours. Yet while your people explore the galaxy in starships, mine are still dressed as barbarians. But your warship... Conceived and powered by sorcery, McCoy. <laughs> Not science. If it weren't for Klee's wizardry, we could never have attempted this mission. You came to destroy the Gola. By any means, we could. Even if it meant sacrificing ourselves. I wrongly made the assumption your vessel was controlling the Gola. And for the attack, I am truly sorry. Captain's log supplemental. Conrack and Klee were sincere. Their entire race was counting on them to wipe out the menace that had held their culture locked in a standstill for centuries. And now they had the help of a starship. Phasers armed and ready, Chekhov? Armed and ready, sir. Let's hope they do more good against the Gola than the photon torpedoes just did. Fire! Three direct hits, but sensors show absolutely no effect. Your weapons are formidable, Kirk, but the Gola seems to know no weakness. Incredible. Conjecture, Spock? I may just be an old country doctor myself, but I'd say the Gola was warping time all around him, making our phasers and photons detonate either in the past or future instead of the here and now. 